however, let us bow our heads, place ourselves in the presence of the Lord. And as always, we open in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Gracious and merciful God, the problems facing our human family are very grave, and we are no longer isolated from one another. We are confronted daily with our addiction to violence and hatred and our greed, and we are heartbroken. The media has been relentless in their presentation and critique, and, all, and we all long for good news that the Lord has given us the remedy for our brokenness. Father, forgive all that do not know what they are doing. He spoke so clearly to us when he offered those words. We ask your Holy Spirit to remind us of the gift of hope in our lives and know that we need to turn to one another for the confidence and assurance that we will emerge from situations that in the short term seem hopeless and that we will banish fear and anxiety from our hearts. Tonight, Heavenly Father, we gather to affirm one another and to remove the barriers that seem to sour relationships and keep us at a distance as we examine the Ten Commandments. Heal our short tempers, our crabbiness, and the grudges we hold against one another or against our system, political system, or those that may be held against our church or financial institutions. And Heavenly Father, we could go on and on. Prompt us to be beacons in the presence of darkness and embrace ideologies that protect our acquisitions. We need your help to stop contributing to the larger greed that tears our lives. And we promise tonight to once again open to that grace. Bless us all with a peaceful spirit and a desire to be reconciled with our family. We ask this prayer in Christ's name. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As always, you, I think, were offered a green sheet to take a quick test. Now listen, guys. This is a multiple choice test. So uh, you should be able to do it very quickly. And if you haven't done it, I'm going to give you about two or three minutes to work on it. And again, once again, don't get nervous if you can't answer all the questions. The big point is to kind of get you to wake up to some of these ideas and thoughts. And at the end, when you leave tonight, pick up a yellow sheet as you go out the door from those handsome young gentlemen back there so that you can see what the answers were according to the teachings of the church.
Okay, you can put that down and don't worry about it. Just be sure and pick up the yellow sheet on the way out tonight and see how we did as far as presenting this session and also how you did as far as maybe having some previous knowledge. The Ten Commandments are an extremely interesting theology in that we receive only a little bit of education on the commandments. And there's so much depth to them, a great deal more than just the words on the page, thou shalt not kill. And that's kind of what I'm going to look at a little bit tonight. But the first thing we need to understand is the Ten Commandments, the division and the numbering of those commandments have actually varied throughout the course of history. Um, they've changed considerably. And the Catechism of the Catholic Church in itself follows the division that was originally established by St. Augustine, which has now become our tradition. Now, I don't expect you to remember all of that, but to know that, that the commandments that we have now for us uh, were actually established by St. Augustine, and we follow that tradition for all of these years certainly adds credence to how important they may be just by time alone. The first three commandments as Catholics that we observe are concern, love of God. They have to deal with our concern, with the church's concern for our love as individuals for God. And then the remaining commandments are regarding the love of neighbor. So, not turn it. <laughs> not going anywhere, Frank. Oh, here she goes. Ah, here we go. Frank saved the day once more. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to go through each one of these. We all know them, but this is the simple form that I'm going through that we follow as Catholic Christians. I am the Lord thy God, thou shalt not have strange gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. Remember, thou keep the Lord's day holy. Honor thy father and thy mother. Thou shalt not kill. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. And thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's goods. Now I know, without question, most of us take those words for exactly what they mean. And that's a good thing. But as we move on and I get into actually describing and breaking down each one of those commandments, you'll see that there's a much greater responsibility and understanding than the words we just see here. For one thing, the Ten Commandments or, or the Decalogue are a list of uh, religious and moral imperatives that according to Judo-Christian uh, Judo tradition were authored by God and given to Moses on the mountain referred to as Mount Sinai. We read that, we read about that in Exodus chapter 19, of verse 23. We can also read about it in Horeb or Deuteronomy chapter 5 of verse 2 where it specifically refers to the form of two stone tab tablets. Now, the word Decalogue, and I know that likely you've heard that word before, means literally ten words. God revealed these words to his people on the holy mountain. And that's where we come up with the word Decalogue. The phrase itself, the Ten Commandments phrase, generally refers to very, very similar passages in Exodus chapter 20 and in Deuteronomy chapter 5. 
I'm not expecting you to know all of that, but know that it comes up in the, in the Bible in different locations. Some distinguish between this ethical Decalogue and the series of Ten Commandments in, in another chapter in Exodus, which is 34. And they actually name them a different name. They name them the ritual Decalogue, which I think we can kind of see that understanding, that ritual obedience to the Lord. The Ten Commandments themselves were specific terms or words of the covenant that were written on, on, on stone at Mount Sinai. God wrote the, the words upon the tablets of stone of the covenant as our Ten Commandments to lead us. Now, I want you to understand something, or at least hear something from me, and maybe someday, five years from now, you can say, you know, I remember hearing that once before. Some historians believe that the Ten Commandments actually originated from ancient Egyptian religion proceeding this time, and postulate or proclaim that biblical Jews borrowed that concept after the exodus from Egypt. There's no proof to that one way or another, but it is an interesting note. And it is interesting because sworn statements that we have now in historical fact bear a remarkable resemblance to the Ten Commandments in their nature and phrasing. So there's some reason to think that that's maybe that there's been a long history even beyond when they were actually presented to Moses. We need to go to the next slide. How do we do that, boss? Okay. Nope. Technology is great as long as it works fine. So if you go to the next slide that you have in your packet, which talks about religious understanding, I'm going to talk about two or three different groups. I'm going to talk about Protestants in general, and then I'm going to talk about our Lutheran Protestant brothers and sisters, our Jewish brothers and sisters, and Catholic and Lutherans. Religious groups have divided the commandments in many, many different ways. Catholics and Lutherans see the first three commandments, as I spoke to earlier, or six verses, as part of the same command, prohibiting the worship of pagan gods. The Roman Catholic Church goes on to use the transition, translation, kill, which is less specific, less specific instead of murder. Some Lutheran synagogues, and I understand the, the Lutheran church in general is broken up into individual synagogues. So uh, a Missouri Lutheran may believe one thing and an evangelical Lutheran may see another. Yep, that's it. So, um, separate, anyhow, the Lutherans separate all three commandments, six verses, into two different commands, one being no other God, and the second one, um, no other God, and the second one being no graven images. Our Jewish brothers and sisters, initial references to Egyptian bondage is important enough to Jews that it forms a separate commandment. Now, Catholics and Lutherans separate the two kinds of coveting, namely goods and uh, the one of flesh, while Protestants, not Lutherans, um, and Jews group them all together. So we can see sometimes there's some, some changes and differences, and I only give you that to understand, so that you understand there is a difference how we see the Ten Commandments. There's a deeper understanding. Okay?
So what we're going to do here, let's come back up a little bit and reflect on, uh, reflect on Christ's commands. He said, the first one is love of God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shall you serve. You shall not take the name of the Lord God in vain, and remember the Sabbath, and keep it holy. Now, what I'm talking about here is how we divide, as Catholic, how we divide up these Ten Commandments. Next half is about love of one another. Honor your father and your mother. You shall not kill. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. And you shall not covet your neighbor's property. So, backing up even a little bit further, in all of the Torah, only ten commandments. Okay, in the Jewish Torah, in the Torah, only ten commandments were written. And that's spoken directly to in Exodus chapter 31, verse 18. Because he talks about touching with the finger of God. The first three of these commandments teach us how to love God. The ones that we're speaking there. Love of God. They teach us how to love God. You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only should you serve. You shall not kill, you shall not commit adultery, as the remaining seven. So we see that it is simply all about love. Love of God, and love of your neighbor, as God has loved us. Can we see the connection back to that verse? We are to love without limit, regardless of race, language, color, creed, or nationality. In fact, we are to love even when we are challenged with what we accept as true eccentric beliefs, ideologies, or opinions. Doesn't mean we have to agree with them, but we are told to, to love them. We must always express compassionate love, even in the face of ugly, even in the face of the ugly reality of suffering. You know, I think back many, many years ago, our Holy Father, Pope Benedict the 16th, in his first letter, God is Love, or Duas Caritas Est which he wrote in 2005, teaches that our service to the poor and love of our neighbor is our fundamental ministry as Christian Catholics. He, his pro proclamation of the word, do you realize what our Holy Father is saying in that statement? I hope you do. You see, this is in the clear ministry of Jesus, it's clear in Jesus' ministry to the hungry, to feed the hungry, the thirsty, the stranger, the naked, the sick, and those in prison. So this is where we come from through this, to this point, to the Catholic social teachings, actually I wrote about a little over a year ago, which are a crucial part of our faith, and it is these that we gain the understanding that we are to love those who hate us every bit as much as we love those who love us. And that we are to love our poorest neighbor as only that will affect change. And we have to, we can look to two modern day, very common people, uh, but yet very special people who have given us that example. Well, actually three. St. Teresa, Martin Luther King, and of course, Mahatma Gandhi. Those are three right off the top of my head that we can look to as perfect examples. And there's hundreds of them out there. The unselfish, sacrificial, charitable act of loving all of God's children is the outward expression of our personal love and desire to be in union with God. So can you see we're actually getting into the Ten Commandments has got a much deeper meaning and understanding than we've always thought. Well, once again, jump, <laughs> jump forward to the next slide, which is titled Dignity. Dignity. 
dignity of the human person. Earlier I spoke to, without regard to nationality, race, color, religion, language, volunteer your time. Volunteer your time to, and talents and treasures to support. Write the life issues, pay visit to Paul, um, prison ministries, domestic violence shelters, and the list goes on and on and on. This is part of the Ten Commandments, brothers and sisters. And these are things that we often don't think about, and we should. What does not work? Well, the worst thing we can do, and it's done every single Sunday. Can you guess what it is? Those people who go to Mass on Sundays and holy days of obligation and believe that they have made their commitment to God and they've done what needs to be done. Forgetting that they have a responsibility by their very baptism, by the sacrament of their marriage, to involve their youth, their children, and grandchildren in Christ-centered activities offered in the parish. And then we are called through our baptism to do the same thing. And we are given the guidance to do so in the Ten Commandments. And then we come to the respect for the dignity of the human person. And it's meant to be an extremely important part of our faith, and always has been. In Romans it states, Owe nothing to anyone except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. And today, love of God and love of neighbor is the heart of Jesus' message. And too many, too many Catholics, unlike you, are not here hearing this and understanding the importance of this responsibility. A number of years ago, a hospital where I came from that I knew very, uh, very well, because my father had actually been the hospital commissioner there for 18 years prior to his retirement. So I knew the place very, very well. They decided through change that they were going, because it's a very small rural town, they were going to offer uh, end of life services, abortion at the hospital. Now, I would hope everybody here would look at a hospital as I look at a hospital as the place of giving life, not taking life. And I know that's how my father felt. I spoke about this two or three times at Mass at our parish. It wasn't a huge parish, but it was a parish that covered the entire, it was for the entire county. And there was plenty of people, and I offered, we had four services there a week, and I spoke both in Spanish and in English to three English services, telling them they were having a public hearing. And we needed to have Catholics down there to support this very issue. You know who was there? Do you think they understood their responsibility? All I could say is the words had fallen on deaf ears and they didn't understand that the very commandments called them to that responsibility. And they didn't take the opportunity. I'm sure you can guess what the commission decided. Okay, next slide. So we're going to go into each one of these commandments. And it's going to sound a little bit like we're examining our conscience. But that's a good thing. Because it helps us get a little better understanding. So in the first commandment, we know that it reads, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Now the Catechism of the Catholic Church defines these. Sins against faith. And they do so in a couple areas. For example, involuntary doubt, hesitation, overcoming objections to what the Lord teaches us through Holy Mother Church. Voluntary doubt, where we say, well, okay, I am Catholic, 
but I believe a woman should have the right to choose. It's voluntary doubt. Disregard or refusal to hold the truth. A person who is neglectful, willing, willingly refuses to assent. Heresy falls under here, of course. The obstinate, post-baptismal uh, denial of some truth that the church offers you. Schism. And of course, we've heard that word a few times in our life. Schism. Refusal of submission to the Holy Father or some uh, Catholic communication. Apostasy. It's a total repudiation of Christian faith. And those all fall under sins against faith under this first commandment. And then we come into sins against hope. Despair. Giving up the hope for personal salvation or for help. Presuming, presuming upon one's own capacities to, to do something without the help of their Lord. Presuming upon God's power or mercy, hoping for forgiveness without conversion. Glory without merit. You know, I once talked about as disciples of Christ, we have to be devoted. And devotion takes hard work. It's not easy. It takes devotion. And to expect that we're going to be disciplined disciples of Christ without working at it, falls against us. Then there's sins against love. Indifference. Ingratitude. How many of us have been lukewarm to the Lord? Or spiritually slothful, bluntly lazy about our worship of the Lord. Failing to ever pick up the Bible and read one verse. And then at times, hatred of God. Then there's the virtue of religion. The rendering to God what is owed God in all of justice. We need to give him his love. That's do him. We need to talk to him. We can't ignore him. Adoration. And they speak to these things. Prayer. Sacrifice. Promises. The Lord has offered us many promises in the sacraments. We need to participate in those sacraments. Now, the main sins of irreligion. Attempting to tempt God, stealing sacred things, profaning sacraments, desecration, buying or selling spiritual things. I mean, many times we've caught people trying to sell spiritual items that have been blessed. Those are spiritual things. You can't do that. A huge example, and I know... Some people are going to groan because they may have done it here in this room, but not knowing any better, which is not your fault. It's our fault, the church's fault, for not making it clear. But I've ran into this before when I've told people it is not proper to burn blessed palms or throw them in the garbage. They are to be done by the church in a special means, in a special way. And that's why we do that here and at Our Lady of the Valley. So, in this one commandment, when we do an examination of our conscience, some of the things that we might want to ask ourselves is, did I doubt or deny that God exists at any point? Did I make sure he was a part of the center part of my life and so that other people would know that he was? Did I refuse to believe what God has revealed to us? Have I ever 
really believed in fortune telling, horoscopes, dreams, the occult, good luck charms, and so on and so on and so on. And I'm not talking about the individual that picks up, I don't even know if they have it in there anymore, that picks up the Sunday paper and reads their horoscope just to have a good laugh for the day, but people who actually believe in that stuff and then profess to be Christian. Did I ever deny that I was Catholic? We should be proud of our Catholicism and make sure people know that we are Catholic. Just do so in a manner that they will want to follow your example. Did I ever at any time leave the Catholic faith? Do I give time to God each day in prayer? Many people don't realize that falls under the first commandment. Did I despair or presume God wasn't listening? Did I seek to surrender myself to God's word as taught by the church? Did I really work at it? Have I ever received communion in the state of a mortal sin? Have I ever deliberately told the lie in confession? Or, ha or have I ever withheld a mortal sin that I was aware of from a priest in confession? So these are just some of the questions that we at least must meditate on and think about as we are examining our conscience. Now the second commandment, if you'll turn to that, is you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. You have heard that it was said to the men of old, you shall not swear falsely, but I say to you, do not swear at all. In summing up, we believe in God, to hope in Him, and to love Him above all else. That is really our duty. The duty to offer God our authentic, deep-held worship. This commandment speaks to, or is regarding, sins against the name of God. The Christian is called to begin the day with traditional prayers and activities. Every single one of us in this room are called to begin our day with traditional prayers and activities. Now, I know most of us would probably like to start off with a cup of coffee. I've learned to put the two of them together. But it's time to spend with the Lord, thanking Him for the blessings that He gave us yesterday and thanking Him for the guidance that He may provide us today. Promises, infidelity to promises using God's name, engaging the divine honor and faithfulness in some way makes out a God out to be a liar. So we don't make promises about things that we're not going to fulfill. Take it up to, go ahead and take it to the third commandment. Profanity. Now, we all know what that one means. It's the first one we'd refer to, actually, when we read this second commandment, is trivializing or taking the name of, the God, of God, Lord Jesus Christ, in vain without um, regard to his sacred character. Blasphemy. Whenever we trivialize or degrade or affront God or sacred things, we are committing blasphemy. And then swearing. This is the incidental swearing outside of using God's name in vain. Calling, calling God to witness our disrespectful manner really abuses his name. And false oaths, such as perjury. So a way to examine is, did I blasphemy um, or insult God? Did I take God's name carelessly or uselessly? Did I curse in any way or break an oath or a vow? Did I get angry with God today? Have I ever wished evil upon another person? 
have I insulted a sacred person or abused a sacred object? So we're starting to see things are stacking up pretty thick in regards to these, these first things. The third commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath to the Lord your God. In it you shall not do day work. The Sabbath in itself was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is the Lord of even the Sabbath. Essentially, it is the duty of the faithful to assure um, to assure the legitimate excuses do, no, do not lead to habits that are prejudicial to religion, family life, and or health. Okay? So, in essence, worship is owed to God. A common one where I came from is... Uh, Guys would often be bringing vessels, sailing vessels, tall, tall sails, we'd call them tall ships, across, and they'd say, well, I'm out in the middle of the ocean, I've got to keep the ship going. You know, that makes sense. It's reasonable, right? What we're doing is meaningless work. It's not necessary because our effort should be, uh, our effort should be paying attention to our religion, to our family life, and our health, and worship owed to God, and joy, which is proper to the Lord's day, works of mercy and relaxation of mind and body. I used to love it when I lived in southern Mexico because you'd go to Mass. It's a beautiful thing, a beautiful Mass in itself. But then after Mass, that you would go out into the courtyard and the bells are ringing and people are dancing, they're playing and they're singing. What a beauty. And their effort, they were making their effort about family life. They were making their effort about enjoying themselves and enjoying their time with their family and enjoying their time with the Lord. I'm sure kids also look forward to all the candy and the corn and everything else, you know, barbecued corn and everything else available. But it, the whole mass was built around that. What a beautiful thing. That's what Sabbath is about, spending time with family and the Lord. So we give joy to, that's proper to the Lord's day. Works of mercy. Maybe it's a time to do some kind of work of mercy as a family. Relaxation of mind and body. It doesn't hurt to take that one day off. When, if we do those things and we sit and we examine our conscience and we come to the point of saying, did I miss Mass Sunday or a holy, obligation, a holy day of obligation through my own fault? And I'm going to address this one very quickly at the, after I go through some of the others. Did I come to Mass on time or leave early? Did I do work on Sunday that was not necessary to be done? Did I set aside Sunday as a day of rest and family day? And did I always show reverence in the presence of Jesus in the most blessed sacrament? Okay. I'm going to come back to it. Did I miss Sunday? Mass on Sunday or a holy day of obligation through my own thought. As we all know that now at this present time, there, there is a, has been lifted for us to miss Mass because of COVID-19. I understand that. However, you know, it, it's important to also understand that if you can go to Walmart and go shopping, if you can gather in large groups and family groups, if people can go to bars and wine bars, and they can do all these other things, then we should be trying to figure out as staff at the parish how to make get full maximum benefit out of the 25% of the people that we can allow for seating capacity. Instead, we don't even come close. Why is that? And I'm not asking for an answer, but I'm just saying, think about it. Think about it. 
you know, I talk to people, and I've, I've mentioned to a couple that are much, much younger than I am, half my age, who are in positions within the church that should know better, who have not been to Mass since the pandemic broke out. And we asked, why not? Well, because of the pandemic. We watch it on TV. It's not the same. Because they're missing a couple things, aren't they? They're missing the opportunity at the Eucharist, for one thing. What greater gift? So what we need to do is we really need to make sure that people understand. If you, you need to get to Mass if you can. Now, I'm not talking about those who have underlying health problems that should not be there or who are not feeling well that we don't want to come, right? But I am talking about those who are fully capable of coming. It's important that we do this. The fourth commandment. Honor your father and your mother, that your days may be long in land which the Lord your God gave you. Um, the, command, the, the, the catechism indicates that the commandment shows the order of charity. It indicates that it is the duty for us to honor our family. And this is accomplished uh, by assisting with and ensuring the following seven freedoms. And they are, we've all been given a freedom to establish and raise a family in faith, the protection of the stability of the marriage, the sacramental marriage bond, the freedom to profess one's faith and raise one's children in it. No one's telling us that we can't. The right to private property, free enterprise, work, housing, and immigration. The right to medical care, aged assistance, and family benefits. And the list goes on and on and on and on, which is concluded within this commandment by theologians who study it. This, this commandment addresses specific duties of citizens and teaches that citizens are only allowed to rebel under certain conditions. The church hopes for us to have a reasonable success. We must understand that God places a high value on authority because he is the one who created it. So in that sense, scripture tells us that all authority, all authority comes and originates from God and he is the absolute authority of the universe. So he has delegated, delegated his principal authority to maintain mankind, maintain order in the world. And he's done that through specific ways, within the hierarchy of the church, within the hierarchy of the family, and that's up and down the ladder. So we have a responsibility. So the family, the children are to obey their parents goes without saying. And most people stop there at that commandments when they're talking to their children. But within that, the wife is to cooperate with her husband. And the husband is, submit, is to submit to Christ and love his wife. In the state, in regards to the state, we are to cooperate with those authority figures and obey the local and federal laws of the land within the boundary of God's love. And then the church. Christians are to submit to the headship of Christ, which is exercised in his spirit. And church leadership. God has established these authorities as delegated extensions of his authority. The family, the state, and the church. So we see that that commandment has a much deeper following than we thought. The fifth commandment, you shall not kill. You have heard that it was said to the men of the old, you shall not kill, and whoever kills shall be liable to judgment. But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother shall be liable to judgment. And I'm going to speed up a little bit looking at the time here, but understand that the major sins against the fifth commandment are 
identified in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. Intentional homicide, which includes abortion, euthanasia, um, which is mercy killing or assisted suicide and suicides. The meaning and respect for the dignity of persons falls within this. Um, bodily integrity, care of the dead, and so on. So when we examine our conscience, we need to look a little bit deeper when it comes to this. Did I kill or physically injure anyone? Did I have an abortion or advise someone else to have an abortion? And if there's any question, one who procures an abortion is automatically excommunicated, and anyone who is involved in that or professes that it's a good idea is automatically excommunicated by themselves. Did I use or cause my spouse to use birth control pills? Did I attempt suicide? Did I take part in any kind of mercy killing? And here's where the deep ones come in. Did I get angry, impatient, envious, unkind, proud, revengeful? Jealous, hateful, goes list goes on and on and on. Things that we don't often think about when we look at this commandment. Did I abuse my children? Have I abused alcohol or drugs? Did I give scandal to anyone, thereby leading him or her into sin? A common one I like I love to use with teenagers, because boys, as we know, get in 